My name is Billy Moore. I live in Centerville. Well, growing up here, I have a lot of favorite memories. Um, but I, I want to be uh, weather contained right here right now. Talk about Hurricane Donna when I was about six years old. I think it was probably 1960 or 59. Uh, I remember huddling in my parents' bedroom with my siblings and uh, listening to the, uh, the wind in the, in the rain against the windows, having no lights, of course. My father was in Hyannis. He worked for the phone company, and he was trying to get crews together to go out and fix all the telephone poles. Uh, the other hurricane I remember was Hurricane Bob in the mid-90s. I was a bartender at the Windjammer Lounge at the time, and uh, for some reason, the Windjammer and Mitchell Steakhouse never lost their lights for a long period of time. Um, I don't know whether it's because we were on the same line with the hospital, but we were up and going pretty fast during Hurricane Bob. Uh, I remember that, you know, it was a pretty severe storm where some people lost electricity for a week or maybe two weeks. And we fed a lot of local people lunch and dinner during that period. Um, also, Calm Electric uh, hired some companies from upper state Maine in New York to come down and help them fix all the lines that were down. And we served them lunch and dinner too. Uh, other memories I have, of course, uh, in the early 60s was with the Kennedy family. Uh, we were, at that time, lived in Hyannis. Uh, we lived on Greenwood Avenue, which is a road that runs from Scudder Ave to Marston's Ave in Hyannisport. And periodically, during the summer months, whether we were walking to the beach or back from the beach or playing in our yard, uh, cars would stop and pull us over and um, ask us for directions to the Kennedy compound. So one summer day, my sister Pam and Bobby and we, we got together and we decided we were going to put a lemonade stand together. And we had made this sign that said, ice cold lemonade, five cents, directions to the Kennedy compound, five cents. So that was our first time, in, my first time, indulging in the business community. Uh, another memory I have with the Kennedys is uh, my brother and Bobby and I, were, we were altar boys at St. Francis. And the president would, uh, on most weekends, would fly into Otis and then helicopter over to the compound. And on Sundays, at 10 o'clock mass at St. Francis, uh, the Kennedys would arrive, usually with Mrs. Kennedy and sometimes with Caroline. I don't remember seeing John at all. I think he was too young at the time. Um, and the church was packed. The West Wing, the East Wing, and the main entrance were just packed. And I used to say to my brother, I don't think these are all Catholics. I think there are other people too here, you know. And, uh, and it got to the point where Monsignor Thompson, after a year or two, worked out a deal with um, the Melody Tent that we'd do two masses at, at the Cape Cod Melody Tent to relieve the pressure at, at St. Francis. And Monsignor would call Bobby and I up, and he'd make one phone call, and we'd do both masses there. So it was kind of neat that, uh, you know, Melody Tent was close to the Hyenas Port, and the Shrivers would show up, and the Kenny families would show up, and uh, it was neat. It was, a, it was an exciting time to be here in the town of Barnstable and Hyenas. And another great memory I have is um, the Kennedy Rink. Back in 58, I believe it was built. It was built with not a roof. The roof wasn't put on until the mid-60s. So I remember, you know, uh, you know, Friday nights was public skating. Saturday mornings was youth hockey. And then Saturday and Sunday afternoons, it was public skating again. And I remember, you know, uh, you know during Christmas time, you know, the, the carols would be playing over the speakers and the floodlights would be on and it would start to snow. And it just gave you great memories, to, you know, to, to grow up at, in that time in Hyannis and on Cape Cod. How to get involved? Well, coming back from college, you know, in 76, 77, you know, uh, the economy wasn't that strong. Um, there wasn't many choices to do, whether you got involved with the building industry, the realty, or work for one of the ult utilities. Um, the restaurant business is one of the things to get involved in. And I worked at numerous places, um, the Backside Saloon, the Mooring Lounge with, the, um, with Mark Chasen and John Chasen, and we had a great crew with Jimmy Bowes and Francis O'Neill and uh, Jimmy Sherman. We just had a great summers there at the morning. I got involved with the Windjammer when Peter Feeney approached me. Um, I was working at Flounders at the time for Leo Fine, and I did a commitment for a year to Leo, and then after that was up, I, uh, I took the opportunity to work year-round at, at the Windjammer Lounge. And really, you know, I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for Peter Feeney eventually asking me to become a partner there with him, and um, 
we were one of the hot spots for the winter time. I mean, we were number one for the winter, and Pax's was number one for the summertime. Um, those things have changed a little, but um, you know, the wind jam is. A, I take great pride at Spanky's because you know I uh, I have in the summertime, July and August, I have 150 employees, and a great majority of them are high school and college kids that come back. My own kids work there. And it's a great starting first job for some of these, these kids because they learn on their feet, they're dealing with money, they're dealing with the public, uh, they're dealing with customers, and um, it's, just, it's just great. Yes, we're just finishing up our, our 13th year, and we're very proud of what we've accomplished there. Uh, when, when this first started out, um, my partner Jeff Spielman and I were we were looking to do some, something different, and the Harbor House came up for sale right after um, the summer of 9-11, and uh, we took a chance. My youngest was only two when I, was at, when I left the Windjammer, and, um, but it's, been, it's blossomed out, and it's, it, it's become um, very successful. Well, you know, when, this all, when things change, when people's lifestyles change, the drinking laws change, the smoking laws went into effect, our industry was changing. And um, I saw it, you know, that window from 10 o'clock at night to 1 in the morning was kind of diminishing. Uh, we went from, at the wind gym, we went from seven nights of entertainment, free live entertainment, then we went down to five nights, then to three, and then eventually went to one night, which was just karaoke. And um, that window from a 10 to 1 was diminishing to a point where, you know, it wasn't about booze, it was about food. And um, I think the future of our industry is about food. And, you know, even though the Windjammer sold a lot of liquor, um, because I do volume at Spanky's, I mean, I, I sell a lot more liquor than he did, but it's, it, it's because you're doing 1,000 people, not 400 people, there's a lot more beer and wine being sold. And there's Baxes and us and not too many other places that are on the water. And people make that comment all the time. And why don't we have more restaurants on the water? Well, it's kind of, you know, it's difficult. Mattakees is a great spot over in Barnstable and the uh, Millway area. But we're fortunate. And we're fortunate that we have something on the water. Uh, we serve seafood. We try to make, you know, one thing about Barnstable and Cape Cod is we have the best seafood in the world right around us. And you have to take advantage of that. Yes, it's all local except for our shrimp. Our shrimp is frozen. It comes from Southeast Asia. But all our other fish, uh, codfish, you know, clams, bellies, strips, swordfish, salmon, all that is, you know, fresh from the Atlantic Ocean. Well, I think that, you know, we can do, you know, I learned this long from uh, Mr. Warren back at Four Seas where he'd hire all the, you know, the pretty high school girls and, uh, then Peter Feeney did it at the Windjammer, and um, I said, if I ever have an opportunity to run my own place, you know, I'm going to use the local, use the local high school kids, whether from Sandwich, Yarmouth, or, or Barnstable, and we've used them all. And uh, it's great because their parents come in, their relatives come in when they're visiting, and um, it makes for a great, great environment for all, for all of us. Well, um, I entered as a freshman in 68, 69 year, and I graduated 71, 72 year. Um, my senior year, my twin brother Bobby was the president of the class, but um, we just had a great community, great coaches, great teachers, and um, because it was troubling times back then, um, the world was going and the country was going through changes. We as a community were going through changes. And like you know, I said earlier, you know, when I was a freshman in 68, 69, we had a dress code, and the dress code was a suit coat and tie. By the time I became a senior, um, we had open campus and no dress code. And things were changing um, drastically throughout the country. It was the Vietnam era, the civil rights era. Um, you know, things like that were going on in this country, and change was happening. Open, what happened was this, the school was expanding. It was getting very, very crowded. And back then, you know, we had study halls. I think you had two or three study halls a week. And um, the administration decided that if you were a senior and you, you, if you had a study hall, you could leave campus and go home or there was a quad in the middle of the school that you could hang out and study. But they needed those classrooms f to, for studying and for people to take classes. So the seniors were allowed to leave, leave school during their study halls. You know, um, 
My first job was at Wimpy's Restaurant in Osterville. We were living at the time on Greenwood Avenue, and uh, we had some friends uh, working at Wimpy's. Doug Bell was one, and Adi Pacheco, and Debbie Dacey was a waitress. And uh, so our father drove us one Saturday morning to Wimpy's, and we went in and we, um, we talked to Mr. Hostetter, and he hired us. He hired my brother as a dishwasher, and he hired me as a, um, as a um, baker's helper. And I'd get there in the mornings, and my first job was to fill the eclairs with this pump. And I'd pump in the cream and the eclairs, and then put chocolate on the top, and pan them out, and bring them out to, um, out to the breakfast area at Wimpy's. If, if you remember, the Wimpy's used to have a breakfast area, which is now where there's seafood cafe and the to-go areas. And uh, we used to make all kinds of brownies, pastries, and, uh, and su supply the breakfast area with all the pastries. One memory I have is um, Mr. Hostetter, he took a liking to me, and um, two or three days a week he'd, he'd drag me out of the uh, bakery area and bring me, uh, he'd take me in his car down to Crosby's Boat Yard, and he'd, he'd have me clean his boat and polish the teak, and his son Skippy was running the restaurant at the time, and every time I came back with Mr. Hostetter, Skippy would give me that glare like, you know, what are you getting away with, you know, but it was a really nice time, and you know, I saw a lot of beautiful boats that I'd never seen before, and just being at Crosby's at, and at 14 years old, and it was great. Well, I think there's, you know, what I know about it, I think the town government's run very good. Um, I know periodically there's talk about a mayor, but I don't think that we're really that ready for that type of thing. I don't get involved with a lot of that stuff, so I don't know too much about that on the business end of it. I think um, over the years, I think the Boston Police Department has done an incredibly great job. Um, we as restaurants meet with the police department in the spring of every year to go over ins and outs of what's changed with their theories and what's changed in our industry. And you know, the bottom line is I think we've learned more about what, what the police department does in their daily life, and they've learned a lot about what we do in our daily life. So the communication is so much better than it was 15, 20 years ago. Henry Lyons I knew back at um, McManus's when my sister Pam worked for him. And uh, the Lyons family used to live above McManus's. And uh, Henry's just a great man. And uh, then he had a place on Main Street. I'd say that was back in the late 70s and then you know he opened up the Harbor House and had that for a number of years and then John Marcoux came in and then Mr. Richards came in and then we came in you know and uh, we've had a lot of locals you know come in and been going there for years or used to work there for years come in and see the changes that we've done and uh, they always like coming back and they've always liked coming back. Well it's in my blood you know uh, I really enjoy going to work every morning. Um, I think, you know, those late nights at the wind gym or as we were getting up in age were, you know, taking a toll on us. So this was a whole new thing. It's a six months run and then you have six months to rest up. And it goes by fast, but um, it's, it's a good kind of life. It's a good life and I'm lucky. Uh, my mother was born in Sandwich. My, uh, my grandfather, Bill Mullally, was a laborer. He worked on the Sagamore Bridge when it was being built. My grandmother, Grace Mullally, was a school teacher in the sandwich, sandwich system. Um, my mother's an only child and my father's an only child. He grew up in Boston, West Roxbury, and my grandfather, Tom Moore, had a restaurant that he lost during the Depression, so he went to work for the phone company and met my grandmother as an operator there. And uh, my father, they lived in Marion, and he worked at the phone company in New Bedford, Marion area. My father went to Tabor, and then uh, went on to Northeastern. And my mother spent two years at Bates and moved closer to home, so she transferred to BU. And that's where my parents met. They had an apartment on St. Patal Street next to each other, and that's where they met. Eventually came back to Sandwich, got married, and, um, and moved to Hyannis. Just, you know, I was so young. Um, I remember that he mentioned a couple of his friends had fallen off the bridge. You know, my f grandfather was, he was one of the original painters, you know, and I think I remember him them bringing in um, some um, people from Canada. I don't know whether they were Indians or we weren't afraid of heights or something, but uh, it was the civil engineers who were building it, and uh, 
My grandfather worked on it. Well, you know, I mean, that's a dream come true. You know, I'm, f I'm fortunate that I could make a living here and bring my children up here. And uh, I'd love for my children to be able to do that. You know, there's always this thing out there that we're trying to keep the young people here to stay and to work. And, uh, but that's been going on ever since I can remember. You know, and, uh, you know, my siblings and some of my high school um, friends, you know, when they go on to college, they graduate, they have to go and live where their job brings them. And sometimes that's not Cape Cod. Um, the one thing beauty about Barnstable and Cape Cod is though that uh, they always come back, whether it's for reunions or for summer vacation or for a holiday. Uh, I'm lucky because I get to see a lot of my high school classmates every year. Well, um, my brother and I, we both were inducted. Uh, we played three sports in high school, soccer, hockey, and baseball. and. Um, Bobby, I think his strong sport was baseball. I think even though he was good in all the other sports, and my, Bobby went on to play in college baseball at UMass, and I went into college to play hockey. But, you know, the highlight of, I think, all of our high school career was winning the state championship in 1972. Uh, we, um, when our freshman, sophomore, and junior year, um, L.A. McSwan was a hockey coach, and he's the one that brought hockey to Marsville High School and started it all. And what a terrific gentleman he was, and what a great coach. Our senior year, Donnie Crowley came in from Newton and um, up at the level of our playing style and um, we went undefeated and I think was still the only undefeated hockey team at Barnesville High School. And that was a hockey cringe at, at that time. Bobby Ewell and the Bruins had just had won the Stanley Cup the same year. And the, you know, it was a hockey frenzy around New England and Boston area. Oh yes, I do. I mean, uh, you know, in college, I see, you know, my roommate was, was on the 76 Olympic team, and I see him a lot. Uh, and then, you know, David Scudder, who just passed, was a great friend. You know, Bobby Smith, Jeff Solos, um, Johnny Hurley, you know. It, it, you know, we, we don't forget the times that we had together. Yeah, so I just want to bring up a small story. You know, my daughter, who's now a sophomore, but two springs ago, um, she was on a national team out in California for her peewee level girls team and it was kind of like an all-star team from Falmouth and Barnes but when we were kids at the Kennedy rink Yarmouth and Falmouth didn't have a rink so they played at Kennedy and they were involved in our youth hockey league and it was funny because we went our last year in peewees we went to the national championship too and it was ironic that Jeff Saul's daughter was the goalie for my daughter's team and Jeff Saul's was my goalie for our team and you're talking 40 years difference you know Well, I, I love all the seasons here. I mean, the town of Barnes was so beautiful, and every village has its uniqueness to itself, you know. And uh, so, I, you know, all the, the, the seasons, I think, are beautiful. I mean, in the summer, I look forward to it, and the beaches, whether it's, you know, Lewis Bay and the Yacht Club or Douses or Sandy Neck or Craigville. Or, and then, you know, when the fall comes, I'm looking forward to, you know, Halloween and Thanksgiving, and then you look forward to Christmas and the winter. and and then the spring comes around and you're getting ready to open up the restaurant again and um, it's all good stuff, you know. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, by the time we closed down, I mean, not too long ago, we, we never really closed, closed, I mean, we closed for, for, to serve people, but I used to do the Christmas stroll, which is always the first Sunday in, in uh, December, so I'd keep the water going and the lights going just so I could sort of chow it down there on the, on the, for the boat parade. Uh, but now that's getting quicker. We'll, we'll be out of there by the end of, right after Thanksgiving, everything will be closed down. And then we start thinking about it. Um, I mean, we're there constantly be, uh, picking up mail and, you know, a lot of our employees collect unemployment and I have to get all that paperwork in during the winter. and. Um, but come, you know, March, we're thinking about starting to clean up again. And we clean when we leave and we clean when we reopen again. Well, what happened was, I think what happened was, back when I was at the Windjammer, and I think this happened to Mr. Richards, is, you know, when the smoking ban went in, they had to put smoking in. First they had smoking areas inside, then they moved everything outside. And people decided, well, what I remember was, 
they were smoking outside, and then they said, well, why can't we eat outside? So that's when outside seating kind of expanded, where it really started with the smokers. And then um, now I don't let any smoking in any of my eating areas. They, I have a smoking area they can go, but, it, you know, I don't, it, now it's getting to the point where there's no smoke at all because somebody might be bothered by it. And it just evolved into that type of thing. Um, you know, I know Mr. Richards, he, he didn't have very much outside seating at all, but he was kind of forced to put tables outside because he had smokers. And same with the wind gym, you know, so it kind of evolved and Main Street got wind of it. And, and outside eating was almost like a European thing and now it's, we've taken over it too. Well, you know, I really think the town's being run very well. I think the town of Barnesville is a leader of all the towns for the Cape. Um, there's always can be some changes. You know, I, you know, I was saying earlier that, you know, the main roads in here, Main Street, 132, Route 28, Mid-Cape Highway, Route 6A, they've all been the same since I was a kid. They haven't changed much. I mean, there's some side roads and some developments and smaller roads, but the main roads that we use haven't changed at all, and I don't think they can change too much. But the traffic certainly has increased, and it's going to increase, and it's not going to, you know, there's going to be more tourists, there's going to be more people living here. And I'm amazed how well it does work, you know, with all the boat traffic we have in the summertime and the tourists going over, and, uh, you know, uh, you know, we don't have very many nightmares, I don't think, as far as traffic is concerned, considering all the traffic we do have. I'm Billy Moore from Centerville, Mass.